Question 81. Jessica March and Adam Pocock are CFA Level 3 candidates and colleagues. The two regularly study together for the Level 3 exam. During one of their sessions, the two individuals gauge, engage in a discussion. Uh, so March says, earlier in the year, I had a discussion with Tim Martin, a Level 3 candidate, who said that the most recent exam was very difficult. Pocock said, difficult or not, I have already told my supervisor that I will become a charter holder shortly after following completion of the Level 3 exam. According to the Standards of Practice Handbook, which individual is most likely in violation? So we've got March. Um, she has shared confidential information with Pocock. So what this is referring to is um, her conversation with Tim Martin, who said the most recent exam was very difficult. Saying the exam was difficult isn't um, a violation. This is going to, and her sharing that with Pocock is also not uh, a violation. So I think we can rule that out. Um, it, when they, if they, if Tim Martin started sharing, oh, they used this formula and that formula, and there was a lot of questions on fixed income and using the time value money calculator. Once you start sharing specifics about the exam, um, that's when things get difficult, or that's when things get uh, become a violation. Uh, so then Pocock has made a guarantee regarding the receipt of his charter. That sounds like it'll probably be our answer. Um, he already told us superior he's going to become a charter holder shortly after following the completion of level three exam. Um, like the confidence, but we obviously can't uh, guarantee that. Um, and then lastly, the March, she has engaged in discussion with Martin regarding the exam and its context. Again, um, saying the exam is difficult isn't necessarily discussing the contents, um, what might be difficult might not be difficult for, what might be difficult for Martin might not be difficult for Jessica March, um, and they didn't talk about anything specific according to the question. Answer B. Question 82, Kelvin Charmer CFA plans to allocate shares to his clients following a recent IPO by a fast growing IT company. According to the CFA Institute Code of Ethics and Standards of Professional Conduct, Charmer, in case of oversubscription subscription of the issue, will most likely breach his duty to clients by A, avoiding oddbot distributions. So this is a good thing and would um, not lead to him breaching his duty to clients, so we can go ahead and rule that out. B, not foregoing sale, any sales to himself. Uh, this sounds like it's probably our answer. If there's an oversubscription, um, putting the clients ahead of yourself is going to be um, important. So B sounds like it'll probably be our answer. Let's make sure we can rule out C. C, prorating to all clients for whom the issue is appropriate. This is also um, a proper thing to do. So essentially, if you're oversubscribed, um, clients should all receive a um, proportion of uh, a proportion of the shares they requested um rather than some receiving shares and some not so we'll go with answer b question 83 which of the following activities most likely represents market manipulation and is also a violation of the cfa institute standards of professional conduct a an investment analyst exaggerates his firm's performance to win new client accounts um, so this is obviously dishonest and would be a violation, but it's not uh, market manipulation. They're not doing anything to kind of inflate prices or anything like that. Um, so we can rule out A. B, a global hedge fund increases the stock price of an oil producer when it makes a significant purchase of its shares. Um, so this is kind of on the fence. Maybe it could be market manip manipulation, um, or it just might be a thinly traded stock and they had to move the price a bit to get the position they wanted. Um, or maybe they're just a foolish hedge fund and uh, didn't realize that um, them buying that much stock would shoot up the price. Uh, so B is kind of in the fence there. Let's look at C. A dealer firm buys and sells stock shares between two accounts under its management to create artificial trading activity. All right, uh, so I think we can rule out B and go with C here. The key on market manipulation is intent. Um, so the dealer is doing this very intentionally to create artificial trading activity. There's no, um, on the hedge fund example, there's no necessarily intent of them. It doesn't say that they wanted to increase the stock price so that they could sell it later to somebody else. Um, maybe they just wanted to own the oil producer and they um, needed to take that price hit to get the position they wanted to. 
Um, whereas in C, the dealer is uh, doing this very intentionally. Um, so we'll go see. Question 84. The employees of Lockhurst Traders, a dealer firm, established an equity fund that invests in highly speculative hot issues for their investment portfolios. The employees received permission from their employer before setting up the fund. A company officer pre-clears all the securities purchased. The latest security purchased by the fund is issued by a manufacturer that has previously undertaken an IPO of the fund stock. The employees have agreed with the manufacturer to purchase a large stock quantity to induce price increase. Sounds like some market manipulation there. Um, the stock will later be sold to clients when its price has doubled. Wow. Okay. Which of the following standards is least likely being violated? So it sounds like two of these standards will be violated and we need to figure out what we're not violating. So fair dealing. Um, we're certainly violating fair dealing. We are planning on selling the stock to our clients after it's doubled. Uh, so we're basically going to buy it, pump up the price, and then offload it to our clients. That uh, is not fair dealing. So we will cross that off since we're violating. B, misrepresentation. Um, it doesn't sound like there's necessarily any misrepresentation here. They... Uh, they ran it through the company um, and they got their approval and they have a company officer to kind of pre-clear all these security trades. So it sounds like they're doing okay there. Um, so we'll go with B for now. Let's make sure we can rule out C. Responsibility of supervisors. There is definitely a violation here um, on the part of this company officer pre-clearing some of these securities um, that they're offloading to clients. So we can uh, say that's a violation as well and rule that out for our answer. We'll go with B. Rainy Beaupre, Beaupre, CFA, works for an investment advisory firm in the U.S. However, she is working as a registered advisor in Camaro, a nation in the Indian Ocean. The law of Camaro does not require her to disclose the referral fee received for recommendations of investment products. Is Beaupre liable to disclose the referral fee? So we're looking at a CFA charter holder that works in a nation... Um, where the law is less strict than the CFA code and standards. The rule of thumb is we always have to follow the more strict of either the CFA code and standards or the local law and regulation. Um, so even though the law does not require disclosure of the referral fee, the CFA um, code and standards does. So we do, yes, we do need to um, disclose this referral fee. So we've got no, yes, yes, we can rule out A right away. And then according to which standard? So yes, according to the standard 1D misconduct, or yes, according to standard 1A knowledge of the law. And we will go with C knowledge of the law, which is kind of describing what uh, we just mentioned, which is we need to follow, uh, we need to know and understand the local regulations and law, and then follow the more strict between that and the CFA code. Answer C. Question 86, a firm values its assets using fair values. Its asset base comprises of the following asset categories. Um, we've got category one, fee-paying discretionary portfolios. Two, non-fee-paying discretionary portfolios. Three, fee-paying non-discretionary portfolios. Or, and four, non-fee-paying non-discretionary portfolios. Based on the requirements of the Global Investment Performance Standards, GIPS, for periods beginning on or after January 1, 2011, the firm's total assets are most likely the aggregate of A, all four categories. So that would entail we need to include assets for all four of these. Uh, categories one and two, which is just discretionary portfolios. Uh, we can rule that out right away since we know that non-discretionary portfolios are included. And then categories one, two, and three, which includes discretionary plus fee-paying non-discretionary. So we're going to rule that out as well, um, since the answer will be A, which is essentially we need to include all of these. Um, and no advice for you here other than just kind of committing that to memory, that for total firm assets, we need to include fee-paying and non-fee-paying discretionary and non-discretionary portfolios. Answer A, question 87. According to the CFA Institute Standards of Practice Handbook, which of the following compliance procedures are members and candidates least likely recommended to consider? Um, so we've got A, prohibiting employees from sharing client details. 
Uh, so we can rule that out since um, this is recommended to consider. Uh, this is going to be a part of client confidentiality. We don't want to be um, telling other people about our clients' personal lives. When you work in finance, you get a lot of sensitive information about clients, and we don't want that to be shared with others. Uh, B, offering different levels of service to clients um, on a selective basis. It's okay to provide different levels of service. Selective basis is where this seems a little tricky. Um, we want to make sure all clients have the opportunity to kind of pay us more to do other stuff. Um, so I'm going to leave this on the table. Seems like it might be our answer. C, limiting the number of employees who know that a recommendation is to be disseminated. Um, we can rule this out since, yes, this is a good practice. And this is really going to help with the material non-public information and helping that from spread. If less people know about the recommendation and anything um, that's not public yet in there, then it's less likely that that material NPI will stay um, uh, keep from getting out into the public. So we'll go with, we will go with answer B. Question 88. Standard 1A, knowledge of the law, requires members or candidates to most likely A, document a violation when dissociating themselves from illegal activity. Um, this could be our answer. Uh, documenting, I don't think, is necessarily required. It's more so the dissociation itself, which is going to be important. So it could be our answer, but let's make sure we... Um, B or C is not better. Uh, B, have detailed knowledge of all the laws that could potentially govern their activities. Um, this is, we can rule out. It's a little over the top. We are not lawyers, and so having detailed knowledge of everything is um, a little over the top. We want to make sure that we're generally aware of everything, um, but every single charter holder having detailed knowledge is going to be... Um, not a realistic assumption. And I think this is where it falls on the compliance departments of a lot of firms to kind of make sure that employees are, CFA employees and all employees are aware of the law, of laws. C, abide by the rules and regulations related to the administration of the CFA exam. Yes, this is going to be our correct answer. It's going to be a better answer than C um, since the CFA examination um, stuff does fall under knowledge of the law. Answer C. Question 89. When establishing trade allocation procedures for client portfolios, members and candidates should most likely consider giving all client accounts participating in block trades the. So just as a reminder, um, trade allocations, so this is basically saying, um, for example, we have, let's say we have 10 clients and we're going to buy them all the same stock and we're going to buy them, um, it'd probably be different share amounts. But let's say we're going to buy 10 different clients, 10 shares of a stock. Rather than doing those trades individually, we're going to just buy 100 block, 100 shares of the stock and get the same um, pricing for all of those. And then after we make that trade, we're going to allocate them to those individual client accounts. So they would each get their 10 shares after the fact. Um, so most likely consider giving all client accounts participating in the block trades the a, same execution price and charging the same commission. Um, sounds right, uh, which is kind of the purpose of doing block trades so we can get a uh, fair execution price for all clients. Um, B, execution price and commission on a first in, first out basis. Uh, we can rule that out. First in, first out is not really relevant since for a block trade we're doing it as a block, as it says. So we're just it's just one trade. Uh, and then same execution commission and execution price based on first in, first out basis. Same thing, um, the first in, first out is not really relevant for a block trade since um, we're doing the trade all at once. So go with answer A. Question 90. Martha Lopez is a portfolio manager at Hampshire Bank, a local investment bank in Florida. HB's policy is to allocate trades fairly and equitably to all client accounts. Lopez trades small cap and mid cap stocks on behalf of her clients. Following a severe decline in small cap stocks, um, Lopez significantly reduces the allocation to these stocks from portfolios most sensitive to losses first, followed by the other client accounts. She also decides to increase the allocation to mid cap stocks for all client accounts. Uh, she fully discloses the actions to her clients after she completes the trades. 
Lopez has least likely violated the CFA Institute standards of professional conduct relating to. So two of these are gonna be violations and one is not. Um, a, fair dealing. This one does sound like it's a violation and the key here is um, first followed by other client accounts. So she significantly reduces the allocation to stocks from portfolios most sensitive to losses first followed by other client accounts. This sounds like it could be okay since you wanted uh, to um, offload the most sensitive to losses. Um, but the problem here is you did these first and then did the other client accounts. If you decided to only offload them from the most sensitive to losses, but keep them in the portfolio for other clients, that could, that would probably be okay um, since you'd be more so distinguishing on the risk tolerance. But since we're doing the other client accounts after, um, that's where the big no-no kind of comes into play there. So we'll rule out fair dealing. Loyalty, prudence, and care. Um, I don't think we violated here. She fully discloses the actions to her clients afterwards um, and you know they're taking a uh, measure to kind of try and move the allocation around how they see fit so i think b can probably be our answer but let's make sure we can rule out c diligence reasonable basis um this one is potentially violated kind of in two ways so we trade small and mid-cap stocks on behalf of clients so there's some assumed level of expertise there for martha um, but really the only information we have on the small caps is there's a severe decline in small cap stocks and that's the reason why she's selling. Um, it doesn't sound like there's any other fundamental reason uh, why we want to get rid of small caps out of the portfolio other than the price movement. And then there's really no um, information given on why we're moving that into mid cap stocks. Um, so we likely violated on the due diligence for the mid caps and small cap stocks. So I think we can rule that out and say we violated and we'll stick with answer B.